National African American Read-In Event for Black History Month. Thank you very much for coming and for participating. My name is Lisa Kelly. I am the Adult Programming Manager and Outreach Manager for the Long Branch Free Public Library. I'm very happy that you're all here to participate in this event. It's just a very casual, informal celebration of uh, reading some good words and celebrating black authors. And uh, we'll learn a little bit more about the event itself in a moment. But I did want to ask everyone at this point to please make sure their cell phones are on silent. We do have a unisex bathroom. It's the one on the end closest to the vending machines. Um, there are water bottles and some hard candies, hand sanitizer on the table for you. Feel free to help yourself. Keep the uh, whistle wet, and uh, we do need to keep our masks on, except if you are reading or um, sipping your water. Um, I did open up our movie theater. If you haven't been here before to a uh, program on our community floor or had a chance to see our movie theater, I invite you to step in and take a look. We have resumed a full schedule of movie viewings every month. Um, which is my job to pick them out and schedule them, which I really enjoy. So for March, we're featuring films for Women History Month and also for Irish, Irish Heritage Month. So each month we'll see a variety of movies and sometimes it'll be a new release or a family film. I'm also trying to start up a program, programming tradition of um, classic movie Mondays where I get to pick something from the golden age of Hollywood to show that hopefully fits in with the theme of the month. So if you'd like to uh, learn more about these events and all the many other events we have, and we do have many, many coming up, some in person, some are still on Zoom, and some are a little bit of both, like this one. We are streaming to Facebook Live. And... Uh, we do generally post our recordings of our programs on our YouTube channel afterwards um, for people to view if they've missed it in person. But if you do want to know what we have going on, I would um, ask you to follow us on social media. And we have a wonderful events newsletter that goes out at the beginning of each month that our um, community engagement librarian puts together. It's very easy to sign up. There's a link on our homepage. And there's also a link on our Facebook page. So I think at this point, I would like to introduce Lynn Humphrey. I've known Lynn for many, many years. And um, she first approached me, it must be about six years ago, mm -hmm. to have a read-in during Black History Month on behalf of the T. Thomas Fortune House in Red Bank. She asked us if we would be a site. And so we did, and that was the first I'd ever heard of this. And I believe we had one last year on Zoom. And so now we're back to in-person, and I'm very excited by this event because I love to read, first of all. I think it's great to gather people together, and all we do is read. Um, but I will let Lynn tell you a little bit more about it, and then we will actually begin the readings. I did just put together a quick list, alphabetical order, and that is how I'll call you up to read. Um, so I hope that's okay with everybody. And uh, we'll get started. Thank you, Lynn. All right, so like she said, my name is Lynn Humphrey, and I am a former uh, resident here in Long Branch, and I run the website called Busy Turtle, busyturtle.com. Um, so, uh, I learned about the read-in many, many, many years ago, and, um, I just wanted to spread the word about it. So, um, so it's run by the National Council Teachers of English. So it was at a meeting in November of 1989, the Black Caucus of the NCTE, um, accepted the Issues Committee's recommendation that they sponsor a read-in on the first Sunday of February. So at the request of educators, Monday was designated for edu education institutions. 
It was Dr. Jerry Cobb Scott, an active member of NCTE and the, and the Black Caucus, who brought the idea to the committee. It was her, it was Jerry's baby. She gave birth to it, she carried it, she raised it, she nurtured it, sustained its life. And the, the African American reading programs embody Jerry's spirit and commitment to black literacy and literature. Following a decade of rigorous campaigning for participants, participants, the African American readings would become a traditional part of Black History Month celebrations. In 1990, the um, National Council of Teachers of English joined in the sponsorship. And they, they have it, it could be a public event or a private event. It could be at schools and churches and libraries and bookstores. And just, it's just a matter of uh, either listening to or provide the readings. And if you are a host, they ask you to submit to the website the location, the number of attendees, and the books featured so that it, it gives a measure of the global reach of this program. Um, this, this initiative has reached more than 6 million participants around the world. And each year, hundreds of thousands of people gather to dedicate time during the month of February and part of March to explore black literature, old and new. And so I'm only really going to tell you about it. Like you can go to, it's ncte.org slash AARI. There's more information on the poster over there about Miss Jerry, Jer, uh, Miss Jerry Cobb Scott. So like I said, I'm going to read um, a, uh, a sermon from Martin Luther King. On November 4, 19, 1968, King preached the drum major instinct from the pulpit of Ebenezer Baptist Church in Atlanta, Georgia. King's ser sermon was an adaption of the 1952 homily Drum Major Instincts by J. Wallace Hump Hamilton. Both men tell the biblical story of James and John who asked Jesus for the most prominent seats in heaven. At the core of their desire was a major drum instinct, a desire to be out front, a desire to lead the parade. King concluded the, ninth, the February 1968 sermon by imagining his own funeral. Imagine that. Okay. Every now and then, I guess we all think realistically about that day when we, when we will be victimized with what is life's most common denominator. That's something we call death. We all think about it. And every now and then, I think about my own death and I think about my own funeral. And I don't think of it in a morbid sense. And every now and then, I ask myself, what is it that I would want said? And I leave the word to you this morning. If any of you are around when I have to meet my day, I don't want a long funeral. And if you get somebody to deliver the eulogy, tell them not to talk too long. And every now and then, I wonder what I want them to say. Tell them not to mention that I have a Nobel Peace Prize. That isn't important. Tell them not to mention that I have three or four hundred other awards. That's not important. <coughs> Tell them not to mention where I went to school. I'd like somebody to mention that that day that Martin Luther King Jr. tried to give his life serving others. I'd like to say, I'd like for somebody to say that day that Martin Luther King Jr. tried to love somebody. I want you to say that day that I tried to be right on the war question. I want you to be able to say that day I did, I did try to feed the hungry. And I want you to be able to say that day I did try in my life to clothe those who were naked. I want you to say on that day that I did try in my life to visit those who were in prison. I want you to say that I tried to love and serve humanity. Yes, if you want to say that I was a drum major, Say that I was a drum major for justice. Say that I was a drum major for peace. I was a drum major for righteousness. And all the other shallow things will not matter. They won't, I won't have any money to, left be, to leave behind. I won't have the fine and luxury things of life to leave behind. But I just want to leave a committed life behind. And that's all I want to say. Lynn. Um, is Kiana Alexander here? 
Okay, Bonnie Jarosky? No, then our next reader is the president of our Board of Trustees, Roberto Perugina. Good afternoon, thank you for, for having me. Can everyone hear me at this tone level? Yes. Okay, excellent, thank you. I chose two poems uh, by Maya Angelou. The Complete Poetry is the, is the name of the book. The first poem, titled Life Doesn't Frighten Me. Shadows on the wall, noises down the hall. Life doesn't frighten me at all. Bad dogs barking, barking loud, big ghosts in a cloud. Life doesn't frighten me at all. Mean old mother goose, lions on the loose. They don't frighten me at all. Dragons breathing flame on my counterplane. That doesn't frighten me at all. I go boo, make them shoo. I make fun, way they run. I won't cry, so they fly. I just smile, they go wild. Life doesn't frighten me at all. Tough guys in a fight, all alone at night. Life doesn't frighten me at all. Panthers in the dark, strangers in the dark. No, they don't frighten me at all. That new classroom where boys all pull my hair. Kissy little girls with their hair in curls. They don't frighten me at all. Don't show me frogs and snakes and listen for my scream. If I'm afraid at all, it's only in my dreams. I've got a magic charm that I keep up my sleeve. I can walk the ocean floor and never have to breathe. Life doesn't frighten me at all, not at all, not at all. Life doesn't frighten me at all. The second uh, poem that I chose by Maya Angelou is titled Equality. You declare you see me dimly through a glass which will not shine, though I stand before you boldly, trim in rank and making and marking time. You do own to hear me faintly as a whisper out of range, while my drums beat out the message and the rhythms never change. Equality and I will be free. Equality and I will be free. You announce my ways are wanton, that I fly from a man to man. But if I'm just a shadow to you, could you ever understand? We have lived a painful history. We know a shameful past. But I keep on marching forward, and you keep on coming last. Equality, and I will be free. Equality, and I will be free. Take the blinders from your vision. Take the padding from your ears. And confess you've heard me crying, and admit you've seen my tears. Hear the tempo so compelling. Hear the blood throb in my veins. Yes, my drums are beating nightly, and the rhythms never change. Equality, and I will be free. Equality, and I will be free. Robert, you stand up and hold the book up, please. Thank you. Okay, China Golden. Okay, Cordelia Golden. Then our next reader will be Robert Goodman. Bob, just stop and hold the book up for me for a moment, please. It's just written down in a notebook. Yeah, thank you. Well, good afternoon, everyone. It's nice to see uh, everyone come out to this to not only just uh, be a spectator, but also to be a reader as well. Um, I am uh, involved in the poetry community here in Monmouth County. I've produced a number of spoken word events, uh, some in cooperation with the uh, Long Branch Public Library has been an excellent partner for events like this. Um, the poem I'm going to read today is from an author by the name of Jericho Brown. He is a contemporary poet. Um, I stumbled across his work by accident. Um, I, was having, uh, I was having an argument with somebody about uh, sonnets and sonnetry. 
And uh, they said, uh, well, nobody writes sonnets anymore. That was an Elizabeth Elizabethan era type of uh, thing. And nobody really writes them anymore. And I said, no, that sonnets are written all the time, every day. And I started searching for some from contemporary poets. And I stumbled across this one from Jericho Brown. Now let me give you a little background about Jericho Brown. He was born in Shreveport, Louisiana. Uh, Jericho Brown was not his original name. He was born as Nelson Demery III. And, you know, it's, uh, it's, it's almost reminiscent of Thurston Howell. <laughs> you know, but um, at some point after he received his Master of Fine Arts, he changed his name to Jericho Brown. So it's not a pen name. That is his name today. He uh, worked his way through college, mostly by working uh, his undergraduate degree was on a scholarship and then uh, and that was uh, in fine arts. His master of fine arts he got through um, San Diego University. He went all the way from Shreveport to San Diego. And then from San Diego all the way back to Emory in Georgia, where he ended up getting his doctorate. He has written five books. Uh, in 2020, he was the Pulitzer Prize winner for poetry uh, for the book, The Tradition, which was a collection of poems. And I'm going to read the eponymous poem itself called The Tradition by Jericho Brown. Aster, Nasturtium, Delphinium. He thought his fingers in the dirt meant it was our dirt. Learning names in heat in elements classical philosophers said could change us. Stargazer, foxglove. Summer seemed to bloom against the will of the sun, which now news reporters claim flamed hotter on this planet than when our dead fathers wiped sweat from the backs of their necks. Cosmos, baby's breath. On this planet, men like me and my brothers filmed what we planted for proof we existed before too late, sped the video to see blossoms, brought in seconds, colors you expect in poems where the world ends and everything cuts down. John Crawford, Eric Garner, Mike Brown. By Jericho Brown. I would uh, leave you with one last note. Um, Mr. Brown now works today as the assistant chief editor of the literary magazine that's published by John Hopkins University Press called Callaloo. It was um, started in 1976, and it is the longest lasting um, literary publication that's been you know, continuously published in 76 for the African uh, diaspora. If anybody wants to find additional information or good literature. Thank you, Robert. Our next reader will be Marshall Hart. On. I'm going to read a poem by <coughs> Langston Hughes. I just want to tell you a little bit about Langston Hughes. It's, the title of the poem is Let America Be America Again. And it's very interesting, did a little research, that after uh, the former president was elected in, 19, in 2016, uh, using the slogan, Make America Great Again, that drew attention to Langston Hughes because he had that poem, Let America Be American Again. Langston Hughes was born in 1902. He died in 1967. He was frequently referred to as the Poet Laureate of Harlem. He was very active in the Harlem Renaissance. Um, he was influenced in his poetry by Walt Whitman, Carl Sandburg, Paul Lawrence Dunbar. He went to Columbia University to study engineering. He lived all over the world. And 
one of the things that's really interesting is his connection with Martin Luther King. We had heard the uh, funeral sermon that Martin Luther King spoke about himself in 1968. Martin Luther King knew Langston Hughes. They were friends all the way back to 1956 at a time in which Langston Hughes got in trouble for his, what we would call today, progressive politics. He was, uh, there was suspicions by Joseph McCarthy and the House and American Activities Committee that he had to testify in, in front of because Langston Hughes was a, a very vocal supporter of the worker in this country. And King's uh, being influenced by Hughes, uh, King recited a Hughes poem from the pulpit called Mother to Son, which is a very emotional poem, which I thought about reading, but I decided to leave the one that I'm going to read. So this is, let America be America again. Let America be America again. Let it be the dream it used to be. Let it be the pioneer on the plain, seeking a home where he himself is free. America never was America to me. Let America be the dream the dreamers dream. Let it be that great, strong land of love where never kings connive nor tyrants scheme that any man be crushed by one above. It never was America to me. Oh, let my land be a land where liberty is crowned with no false patriotic wreath. But opportunity is real and life is free Equality is in the air we breathe. There's never been equality for me, nor freedom in this homeland of the free. Say, who are you that mumbles in the dark? And who are you that draws your veil across the stars? I am the poor white, fooled and pushed apart, I am the Negro bearing slavery's scars. I am the red man driven from his land. I am the immigrant clutching the hope I seek and finding only the same old stupid plan of dog eat dog, of mighty crush the weak. I am the young man full of strength and hope tangled in that ancient endless chain of profit, power, gain, of grab the land, of grab the gold, of grab the ways of satisfying need, of work the men, of take the pay, of owning everything for one's own greed. I am the farmer, bondsman to the soil. I am the worker, sold to the machine. I am the Negro, servant to you all. I am the people, humble, hungry, mean, hungry yet today despite the dream, beaten yet today, oh, pioneers. I am the man who never got the head, the poorest worker bartered through the years. Yet I am the one who dreamt our basic dream in the old world while still a serf of kings, who dreamt a dream so strong, so brave, so true, that even yet its mighty daring sings in every brick and stone, in every furrow turn, that's made America the land it has become. Oh, I'm the man who sailed those early seas in search of what I meant to be my home, for I'm the one who left dark Ireland's shore and Poland's plain and England's grassy lea and torn from black Africa's strand I came to build 
a homeland for the free. The free? Who said the free? Not me. Surely not me. The millions on relief today. The millions shut down when we strike. The millions who have nothing for our pay. For all the dreams we've dreamed. And all the songs we've sung. And all the hopes we've held. And all the flags we've hung. The millions who have nothing for our pay. Except the dream that's almost dead today. Oh, let America be America again. The land that never has been yet. And yet must be the land where every man is free. The land that's mine, the poor man's, Indians, Negroes, me, who made America, whose sweat and blood, whose faith and pain, whose hand at the foundry, whose plow in the rain must bring back our mighty dream again. Sure, call me any ugly name you choose. The steel of freedom does not stain. From those who live like leeches on the people's lives, we must take back our land again. America, oh yes, I say it plain. America never was America to me. And yet I swear this oath America will be out of the rack and ruin of our gangster death, the rape and rot of graft, the stealth and lies. We, the people, must redeem the land, the mines, the plants, the rivers, the mountains and the endless plain, all, all the stretch of these great green states and make America again. Thank you very much, Marshall. I am the next reader, and we're going to go in a different direction. Um, I chose some uh, contemporary romance by the author Talia Hibbert, who is a black British writer. Um, this is a fun series that I've been reading. I've just completed. It's actually three books about three sisters in contemporary London. Um, kind of, you call, I guess you'd call it urban chick lit. Very fun, fun family, cast of characters that recur from book to book. Um, each sister uh, has a little bit of a challenge. One has fibromyalgia. The other one is slightly autistic. Um, and they are romances. They can be a little spicy. and uh, But they're just fun reads. And I thought I would just share a little bit from the first pages for you. Um, so the first one is called Get a Life, Chloe Brown. Once upon a time, Chloe Brown died, nearly. It happened on a Tuesday afternoon, of course. Disturbing things always seem to happen on Tuesdays. Chloe suspected that day of the week was cursed. But thus far, she'd only shared her suspicions via certain internet forums. And with Danny, the weirdest of her two very weird little sisters, Danny had told Chloe that she was cracked and that she should try positive affirmations to rid herself of her negative weekday energy. So when Chloe heard shouts and the screech of tires and looked to her right and found a shiny white Range Rover heading straight for her, her first ridiculous thought was, I'll die on a Tuesday and Danny will have to admit that I was right all along. But in the end, Chloe didn't actually die. She wasn't even horribly injured, which was a relief because she spent enough time in hospitals as it was. 
Instead, the Range Rover flew past her and slammed into the side of a coffee shop. The drunk driver's head-on collision with a brick wall missed being a head-on collision with the flesh and blood Chloe by approximately three feet. Metal crunched like paper. The middle-aged lady in the driver's seat slumped against an airbag, her crisp, blonde bob swinging. Bystanders swarmed, and there were shouts to call an ambulance. The next book in the series, well, actually the last book of the three, is called Act to Your Age, E.B. Brown. Chapter one, Evie Brown didn't keep a diary. She kept a journal. There was a difference. Diaries were horribly organized and awfully prescriptive. They involved dates and plans and regular entries and the suffocating weight of commitment. Journals, on the other hand, were deliciously wild and lawless things. One could abandon a journal for weeks then crack it open one Saturday evening under the influence of wine and marshmallows without an ounce of guilt. A woman might journal about last night's dream or her growing anxieties or the lack of a new entry in her favorite online fan fiction series. In short, journaling was, by its very nature, impossible to fail at. Eve had many journals. She rather liked them. So what better way to spend a lovely, lazy Sunday morning in August than journaling about the stunning rise and decisive fall of her latest career? Now, I wasn't able to get my hands on the third entry in the series, so just want to share uh, a short page from Kindred by Octavia E. Butler, who's a science fiction writer. I read a lot of science fiction, but I've never read Octavia Butler, maybe a short story. So I've always wanted to read her, so I thought, okay, I'm gonna, I'm gonna choose this one. Um, she is extremely well regarded as a science fiction writer. I, I didn't really delve into her background, but I know she's won many awards. And uh, she's also one of the very, I'd say rare, black science fiction writers. There aren't too many. Um, and I'll just read. This book has been around for at least 25 years. And again, it's Octavia E. Butler, not to be confused with the actress Octavia Butler. Uh, and this is called Kindred, from the prologue. I lost an arm on my last trip home, my left arm. And I lost about a year of my life and much of the comfort and security I had not valued until it was gone. When the police released Kevin, he came to the hospital and stayed with me so that I would know I hadn't lost him too. But before he could come to me, I had to convince the police that he did not belong in jail. That took time. The police were shadows who appeared intermittently at my bedside to ask me questions I had to struggle to understand. How did you hurt your arm, they asked. Who hurt you? My attention was captured by the word they used, hurt, as though I'd scratched my arm. Didn't they think I knew it was gone? Accident, I heard myself whisper. It was an accident. So I'm sure I'll keep reading this one at some point. And now I would like to um, welcome up our next reader is Ebony Lawrence Smith here. Yes. Okay, Ebony, welcome. Yes, if you would just stop and hold it up for a moment. Thank you. I'm a teacher, so I'll do teacher style. So this is called the ABCs of Black History. A is for anthem, a banner of song. What wraps us in hope lets us know we belong. We lift up our voices, lift them and sing. From stages and street corners, let freedom ring. B is for beautiful, I'm talking to you. Your voice, your height, your hair, your hue. 
B is for brave, for bright, and for bold, for those who stood up even when they were told to step back, stand down, remember their place. B is for brotherhood, for believing in grace. C is for community, where we live, laugh, and eat, and for the church where we worship, mourn, sing, and meet. Did you hear Reverend King preach on his dream of civil rights, human rights, a powerful theme? B is for diaspora, pulled from our homes. We were carried away in ships on the foam to Haiti, Cuba, America, Brazil. Our names are different, new but still. We are connected, then, now, forevermore, to that long ago, far away African shore. E is for explore, to study a place, like Matthew Henson, the Arctic, May Jemison space. E is for education, for expanding the mind, like Ruby Bridges, Linda Brown, The Little Rock Nine. The first black children in an all-white school, they open the doors and challenge the rules. F is for food, grown and farmed with our hands, worked and filled and pulled from the land. For fried fish, ham hops, warm buttermilk bread, or maybe the sharp taste of mustards instead. F is for folklore, by the light of the moon, for family, for freedom, for jumping the broom. G is for go, towards cities we were bound, for the great migration from country to town. From farming the land to the factory floor, we carried the blues on our backs, not much more. H is for Harlem, those big city streets. We walked and we danced to our own jazzy beat. When Louis and Bessie and Duke owned the stage and Langston and Zora Neale Hurston the page. I is for imagine, invent, innovative. For all of the ways we are so creative. J is for Juneteenth. We were finally free, or so we hoped in this moment of glee. J is for Juvert, when the drummers drum drum, from Trinidad, Grenada, and Haiti they come. K is for Ken, our fathers and mothers, our ancestors, elders, our sisters and brothers. K is for Kwanzaa, which honors that bond. Ask Kabari Ghani, and we might respond. Umoja, ku Ujima, Ujama, Nia, Kumba, Imani. L is for love. L is for love. L is always for love. M is for march, for lifting our feet taking the movement, the cause to the street. Black lives matter, every breath, every dream, every thought, each idea, each impossible scheme. The might of our message is easy to hear. The drumbeat of hope is louder than fear. N is for newspapers, we start our own. To tell our stories and let it be known. We deserve the front page, we deserve to be seen, and to also be featured in slick magazines. O is for organize, for getting together, to sit in and boycott to make our lives better. Thank you, Fred Hampton. Thank you, Diane Nash, for not being afraid of the impossible clash with pe police and people who shouted and teased. Because of you, we can go where we please. P is for power. It's part of our core. Sometimes it is quiet. Sometimes it must roar. Like a panther. Isn't that right, Huey P.? Power for people like you and like me. And who do you think has more power than most? The president. Obama was first to the post. But Shirley, Shirley Chisholm, um, Boston unbought, um, came so much closer than most people thought. A black woman could, which just goes to show, P is for possible, so glow on, child glow. Q is for queens. Behold and bow down. Shield your eyes from the shine of their crowns.
Ours for rise to reach for the top, relentlessly striving, refusing to stop. Like ball players, boxers, and gymnasts who fly, sprinters and skate skaters who zoom right on by. Old records, old thinking, a sight to behold. They went for the win and grabbed for the gold. S is for scientists who charted the stars, studied the bees, took care of our hearts. For Benjamin Banneker, Patricia Bath, for Katherine Johnson's beautiful math. S is for soul, how sweet the sound. From the croon of Sam Cooke to the wail of James Brown. Brother Ray on the keys, Sister Tharp dressed in mink, and Queen Aretha sang, You Better Think. T is for Tuskegee, an all-black school where students learned trades and toiled with tools. That's how we will rise, said Boss Booker T, but another smart man just didn't agree. W.E.B. Du Bois said, industry's fine, but I think it's better to work on, our, work on your mind. They had different ideas, but here's what's true. In their own words, they were thinking of you. U is for United States. This story is tough. The birth of a nation was deadly for us. We, we the people in the land of the free, no one who was enslaved would agree. You was for unbroken, unshaken, unbound, like Harriet Tubman who went underground, took back her freedom and freed hundreds more, some as a spy in the great civil war. But when the states were united again, the fight for our freedom and lives didn't end. So you is for unfinished, this American tale. With courage and strength, we will prevail. V is for vote. Do you know what that means? The freedom to pick and choose as you please. The freedom to choose who makes the rules, who has the power, who gets the tools, to make their lives better. That's why we fight. The freedom to vote is a true civil right. W is for writers whose wisdom and words bring to life worlds where our voices are heard. Rappers and poets and songwriters too, all those who spin from our point of view. X is for Malcolm Malik El Shabazz, known also as Red Malcolm, Li Malcolm Little. By, many, by any means necessary, he insisted on change. Starting with X, he reclaimed his name. Y is for young, gifted, and black, like Lady L Lorraine, who never looked back. She wrote of big dreams in rooms so small, it's hard to believe they were dreamed in at all. Lorraine and her work moved Nina Simone so much that Nina made work of her own. Young, black, young, gifted, and black, a banner of song that wraps us in hope, lets us know we belong. Z is for Zenith, the highest, the peak. The top of that mountain King said we would reach. He won't get there, he won't get there with us, but still we march on, rising, rising, like the sun with the dawn. Thank you, Ebony. So next up we have the Richardsons. We have Twana and Bryce here today. So I don't know who wants to go first. Okay, so let's welcome Bryce. So Bryce, let me get your photo. Can you hold the book up? Thank you. My name is Bryce Roden and I am in the fifth grade and I go to Gregory Elementary School. I'm gonna read the Black Boy George. I'm gonna read the first two pages. Here's a secret. I, I don't like watching the news. Is that weird? It's because for a long time, when I would come into my, the kitchen for my fifth snack in 30 minutes and my parents had the television on, the news was always reporting on some local shooting or death, or some other tragedy. That made my mother shake her head and my father scowl at the TV. Because nine times out of 10, a place like mine is screen, 
Here's another secret. When I'm happy, I cry. Happy for myself, happy for my friends, happy for some stranger who just won a lifetime supply of string cheese. It doesn't matter. I will tear up as I'm jumping up and down in excitement. One more secret. I want you to be happy, okay? That one wasn't really a secret, but it had to be said. So just pre pretend with me, okay? And as long as we're pretending, imagine me dumping those three secrets into a giant bowl, inviting 16 black author friends to help me stir while they add a lot of magic and a sprinkle of swag. And what do we get? Black boy joy. The term was coined back in 2016 by Danielle Young and has grown to encompass the revelry, the excitement of cheer fun of growing up as boys in and out of the hood. Their stories, our stories, deserve to be highlighted on the afternoon news, explored, seen, and celebrated. I am thrilled that this book brings together so many different types of these stories from so many incredible authors. Sit back, grab your string cheese, prepare to laugh, cry, and maybe even dance. But most of all, prepare to feel joyful. Thank you so much, Bryce. And now I'd like to welcome Twana Richardson, his mom, to the podium. <clears throat> Hello everyone, uh, my name is Twana Richardson. I'm an educator here in Long Branch. Uh, many gamuts I'm representing. I'm a student advisor at Gregory School for Long Branch Public Schools. I am one of the founders of Jacob's Ladder, um, along with Mrs. Ebony Lawrence, and I'm also a commissioner for Long Branch Housing Authority. Um, with that in mind, I'd like to thank uh, Mrs. Lynn for introducing me to the read-in, and also Mrs. Lawrence, whose um, focus is on literacy at Gregory School. Um, we've been doing the read-in at Gregory School every Friday um, for 20 minutes, and we've been logging. So that's 609 students reading African-American literature. Um, I selected Amanda Gorman poems Call us what we carry. <clears throat> uh, one of her poems is from a section she titles Resolution. The Miracle of Morning. We thought we'd awaken to a world in mourning. Heavy clouds crowding and society storming. But there's something different on this golden morning, something magical in the sunlight, wide and warming. We see a dad with a stroller taking a jog. Across the street, a bright-eyed girl chases her dog. A grandma on a porch fingers her rosaries. She grins as her young neighbor brings her groceries. While we might feel small, separate, and all alone, our people have never been more closely tethered. The question isn't if we can weather this unknown, but how we will weather this unknown together. So on this meaningful morn, we mourn and we mend. Like light, we can't be broken even when we bend. As one, we will defeat both despair and disease. We stand with healthcare heroes and all employees, with families, libraries, waiters, schools, artists, businesses and restaurants and hospitals hit hardest. We ignite not in the light, but in lack thereof, for it is in loss that we truly learn to love. In this chaos, we will discover clarity in suffering, we must find solidarity. For it's our grief that gives us our gratitude, shows us how to find hope if we even lose it. So
So ensure that this ache wasn't endured in vain. Do not ignore the pain. Give it purpose. Use it. Read children's books. Dance alone to DJ music. Know that this distance will make our hearts grow fonder. From these waves of woes, our world will emerge stronger. We'll observe how the burdens braved by humankind are also the moments that make us humans kind. Let each morning find us courageous, brought closer, heeding the light before the fight is over. When this ends, we'll smile sweetly, finally seeing in testing times, we became the best of beings. Thank you. Thank you very much, Twana. Our next reader is Lorraine Stone. Greetings. Hello. Are y'all alive out there? <laughs> Ubuntu, South African word for you. Okay, first of all, shameless, not quite self-promotion, but can you read what this shirt says? Hampton University And what is Hampton University? What is it? It's an HBCU. Thank you. And who graduated from there? Oh, <laughs> Okay, we won't, okay. we won't take you there. Okay. <laughs> That's the alma mater. Hampton okay. graduate. I am at risk of telling my age. This year, when I go to the re reunion in the spring, my class is the emeritus class, which means, oh my God, we have been out of Hampton for 50 years. I can't stand it. <laughs> I do not know how this happened, but anyway. But remember, HBCUs are powerful places of education. Um, I'm going to start with Great Migration. Um, I didn't know when I picked it up, but this is actually a poem. And it is beautifully illustrated by an African-American, a great African-American um, artist, Jacob Lawrence. Now, I got it from here, so when I go, I'm going to put it back over there. Feel free to pick it up and look at it again. The Great Migration. <clears throat> Around the time I was born, many African Americans from the South left home and traveled to cities in the North in search of a better life. My family was part of this migration. There was a shortage of workers in northern factories because many had left their jobs to fight in World War II. No, sorry, in the First World War. The factory owners had to find new workers to replace those who were marching off to war. Northern Industries offered Southern Blacks jobs as workers and lent them money to be repaid later for their railroad tickets. The northbound trains were packed with recruits. Nature had ravaged the South. Floods ruined farms. The bold weevil destroyed cotton crops. And the Civil War also ravaged the South. That's not in here. I just thought I'd add that. The war had doubled the cost of food, making life even harder for the poor. Now these are his pictorial descriptions of a poor 
black family, hungry. Ooh, man, grab my bag and throw it under the chair or something. Sorry about that. Railroad stations were so crowded with migrants, the guards were called in to keep order. The flood of migrants northward left crops back home to dry and spoil. Crops burning up under the hot sun. For African Americans, the South was barren in many ways. There was no justice for them in the courts and their lives were often in danger. Although slavery had long been abolished, white landowners treated the black tenant farmers harshly and unfairly. And so the migration grew. Segregation divided the South. The black newspapers told of better housing and jobs in the North. Families would arrive very early at railroad stations to make sure they could get on the northbound train. Early arrival was not easy because African Americans found on the streets could be arrested for no reason. Now when you look at these, some of them may not look exactly like what you think. What's, what's this got to do with the newspaper? Or what's this got to do with people going early? An artist is able to draw or paint and interpret. So sometimes you have to really take a long time to look at a picture to really get what the artist was saying to you. And the migrants kept coming. And the strong men keep it coming. Another poem, sorry. In the South, there was little opportunity for education and children labored in the fields. These were more reasons for people to move north, leaving some communities deserted. There was much excitement and discussion about the great migration. In the South, little children didn't go out into the fields to pick cotton, plow, hold and pick the crops. School was not a possibility for many young black children. Agents from northern factories flocked into southern counties and towns looking for laborers. Families often gathered to discuss whether to go north or stay south. The promise of better housing in the north could not be ignored. So let me see a show of hands. Given everything I've read, if you were living in the South at this time, raise your hand if you think you would have gone North. Raise your hand if you think you would have stayed South. Okay, that, that's okay. But you know, a lot of people did stay in the South. And there are other books and that's another story, so I'm not gonna go there. The railroad stations were crowded with migrants. Letters from relatives in the North and articles in the Black Press portrayed a better life outside the South. Many migrants arrived in Chicago. Now, Black women are known for wearing their hats, as you can plainly see. In Chicago and other cities, they labored in the steel mills and on the railroads. Again, the artist's interpretation of railroads and mills. And the immigrants kept coming. How did they get there? Some on trains, some did a lot of walking. Southern landowners, stripped of cheap labor, tried to stop the migration by jailing the labor agents and the migrants. Sometimes the agents disguised themselves, 
to avoid arrest, but the migrants were often taken from railroad stations and jailed until the trains departed. Black and white Southern leaders met to discuss ways to improve conditions to stop the flow of workers north. Although life in the north was better, it was not ideal. Many migrants moved to Pittsburgh, which was a great industrial center at the time. Although they were promised better living, better housing in the north, some families were forced to live in overcrowded and unhealthy quarters. What's a big city nearby us where you think people might have migrated to? Newark. Newark. Patterson. Patterson. Jersey City. Jersey City. What's outside of New Jersey? Philly. New York. Philly and New York. Yes, those are two big ones as well. The migrants were soon to learn that segregation was not confined to the South. Many Northern workers were angry because they had to compete with the migrants for housing and jobs. There were riots. So just because you left the South wasn't a bed of roses, wasn't necessarily a lot easier. It was different. Longtime African American residents living in the North did not welcome the newcomers from the South and often treated them with disdain. The migrants had to rely on each other. The storefront church was a welcoming place and the center of their lives in joy and in sorrow. There were many entertainers in the North, New York, Newark, and this is a depiction of that. People went to church for comfort, for support, and that is still true today. Maybe not as much, but still true. Black professionals such as doctors and lawyers soon followed their patients and clients North. Female workers were among the last to leave. Life in the North brought many challenges, but the migrants' lives have changed for the better. Children were able to go to school and their parents gained the freedom to vote. Well, that's another story too. Rather simplistic there. And the migrants kept coming. Theirs is a story of African-American strength and courage. I share it now as my parents told it to me, because their struggles and triumphs ring true today. People all over the world are still on the move, trying to build better lives for themselves and for their families. Now there's a word that many of you have heard in school and we hear every day, immigration. So migrants are still an issue and immigration is still <coughs> a hot button here in this country. Thanks. Okay. Yeah, I this before I go because it was so cute. I just found it. Okay. <clears throat> when I born, I black. When I grow up, I black. When I go in sun, I black. When I scare, I black. When I sick, I black. And when I die, I still black. And you, white fella, when you born, you pain. When you grow up, you white. When you go in sun, you red. When you cold, you blue. When you scared, you yellow. When you sick, you green. When you die, you gray. And you call me colored? <laughs> I don't know if any, I don't know if she said it before she came out because I was in the restroom. Okay. Lorraine is my friend. Okay, I've known her for many, many years. 
And I talked about it on my website, so I have my cards here. Lorraine is what we call the wisdom keeper. She has a website, it's on my website. I run it for her. She does um, portrayals of uh, African American women. Heroes. Yeah, uh, yeah, in full women. costume. Yes, you've been Harriet Tubman. Harriet Tubman. Um, Harriet Sojourner, Mary Bowser, uh, Ida B. Wells. Uh, yeah, she's, she is. And a few, yeah. Mostly her things happen during February. we got to get her out there for the rest of the year, too, and everything. <laughs> but, you know, so I usually, I usually know what's going on with her, and she I put it on the website for her and everything. So, And we also, she used to be a member. I'm a member, too, of the uh, T. Thomas Fortune Cultural Center in Red Bank. I'm still a volunteer. Yeah, yeah, we're, we're both we're volunteers. Now. And that book she just got through reading, Lisa said, I, I can have it. Yes, that was actually donated to us last week wow. by a community member, Mark Davis. And uh, I really actually want to take a closer look at those illustrations, but yeah, yeah. I would be happy to contribute that to the T. Thomas Fortune. Well, we have a library so. up at the second floor, which I am the librarian for. It's the, it's the Carrie Smiley Fortune Research Library. We don't allow people to take anything out. And who out. was Carrie Smiley Fortune? Yeah, uh, Carrie Smiley Fortune was the wife of T. Thomas Fortune. Okay. And um, well, in the house, she was the one who owned the most of the books in, in the house and everything. Had their own library, but we selected, we elected to name the library after her. But our library is mostly about African American history, predominantly. So you're welcome to come and visit us on Saturdays and Sundays between one and five. I have cards for the T. Thomas Fortune Cultural Center Thank too. You, thank you, Lynn, and thank you, Lorraine. I do want to actually take a closer look at. The illustrations in that book mm -hmm. and uh, speaking of artists it reminded me that the library is co-sponsoring a program Tuesday night Tuesday 2222 two, 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 uh, with the Madawan Aberdeen Library and several mm -hmm. other libraries in our library consortium right, that's yep. called um, answering the call artists of the Harlem Renaissance and uh, that's on zoom at seven o'clock and there's no registration so if you want to attend you Please give me a call or email me or talk to me today and I can email you the Zoom link. Um, I'm sorry. <laughs> I'm sorry. I, I remember things after I said after you said the Harlem Renaissance. So the Teak Thomas Fortune, we're doing a Zoom uh, no, Facebook Live, something, whatever it's live. We're doing a read-in on the 27th, and we're doing from the Harlem Renaissance to um, what you just said. Um, Answering the call, artists of the Harlem Renaissance. Yeah, Harlem Renaissance. Anyway, yeah. anyway, we're doing that and everything. So that's that's a. Is that at Griffey's? No, Griffey's is the twenty sixth. Okay. Okay, so there's a place called Griffey's Organics here in Long Branch at one forty four, one forty one, Brighton, Brighton Avenue. Uh, I am going to be there hosting another read in, from three to four, and you can come and pick another something else to read and come and read something. If you want. What day is that now? That's Saturday, the Saturday 26th. Six. And one more little plug before we move on with the program. On Saturday the 26th here at 11, so we'll be done well in time for your presentation, I have another Black History Month program called um, the Black Brain Center of America. It is presented by Tracy Hall. She's a park ranger out at Sandy Hook. And it's discussing the uh, Black scientists who were um, stationed at Fort Monmouth in the 50s, 40s even, I think, mm, yeah. um, and how they developed some really, really important technology. And, and it was popularly dubbed the, that they were the Black Brain Center of America. So she's going to give a presentation here in person, right here on Saturday. Um, so I... Jack, I know you said you don't want to read, but I wanted to just give you one more opportunity if you'd like to read. Uh, I, I don't mind if I have something to read, but I haven't you done anything in advance of coming today. I just came just to listen to that. Oh, well, thank you. This is Jack Kearns. He's also a trustee on the library board. So thank you for attending. Um, did you want to pick something out? I, I did so bad with it, I think. Well, then let's go on to our, our, our um, finale 
with, um, I want to welcome Kate Wanyana and her son Timothy. Kate used to volunteer here some years ago. She's now a librarian at another library. And she is actually also a published poet. We have her book here in our new book collection upstairs. And uh, her son Timothy is here. And he's going to read some of his mother's poems to us today. So welcome. Good afternoon, sorry. Good afternoon, everyone. Hi. Um, I'm going to be reading the book The Drum Beat by my creative, wonderful, and talented mother, Kate Wananda. And um, I will just say that this this book in general, it just it's just a whole um, basic inspiration about the stuff that we all go through as people, as human beings on this earth. And just like despite like you know like the stuff like being happy or good or sad scary all that stuff that that no matter what that we can all still just make it through so that we can all still make it and, and, and just get on top of there but um the first poem that i'm going to read today is it's a poem called i find it hard I find it hard to write of sunset, of brilliant moon that makes me swoon, of scented breeze, of singing birds, while their beds are hard, their days are set. They cry at noon with hunger swoon. Their thirsty tongues freeze like dead mockingbirds. I find it hard. I find it hard to write rhyming words of beautiful blue skies that charm my brown eyes of scented rosebuds, of honey and bees. While their lives are hard, their dreams are but words, their future dead lies under colorful lies, under colored suds that fly off like bees. I find it hard. I find it hard to sing morning song of warm milk and bread that light up my head, of scented hot brew, of warm morning hugs, while their beds are hard and their nights are long, their dreams are dead and rot in their head like nasty black brew that their insides hug. I find it hard. I find it hard to write down my thoughts, to put down my words, to put down my songs, to put down my pen. I find it hard. All right. Uh, so the second poem that I'm going to read is, it's called To Mock Killing a Bird. I'm, I'm, I'm pretty sure that some of you have actually heard it from before. I'm from uh, To Kill a Mockingbird. Mm -hmm. mocking Blackbirds and ravens, dark and mysterious, messengers of hope or harbingers of doom. Crossing the havens, blackbirds are curious and silently hope not to meet their doom. Be mistaken for ravens, blackbirds and ravens, their ways contentious with blackness to cope. Elegance or doom, sixes and sevens, 13 is mysterious. Does it bring hope? Does it spell doom? Blackbirds or ravens? Blackbirds and ravens, the young now anxious that knotted rope inside my room, does it trap ravens or blackbirds furious and praying they hope that the day won't loom to kill blackbirds and ravens? Blackbirds and ravens to wolves both delicious as hunters they hope that both meet their doom. Blackbirds or ravens, their fate not serious, they only fill room. Blackbirds, black ravens to kill a mockingbird or mock killing a bird? Are ravens blackbirds, or blackbirds blackbirds, or blacks blackbirds? To kill a mockingbird, or mock killing a bird? Mm. 
The third poem I'm going to read is called, I Can't Breathe. <clears throat> I can't breathe with long legal arms across my throat, the deadly chokehold under lethal charm, choking my throat. I can't breathe. I can't breathe with six foot arms weaving my coat and bony hands hold an ice cold charm across my throat. I can't breathe. I can't breathe with hot steel arms burning my throat and starving household. Pale ebony arms, dry burning throat. I can't breathe. I can't breathe until choking arms that loaded the boat, that golden chains had, will cut loose my arms. Stop twisting my throat. I can't breathe. I won't breathe. Will raise up my arms, won't be footnote. Your tail upholds, put down my arms. With open throat, I shall breathe. Thank you. And now for the finale. I'm going to read the very last one, last poem. It's called Hearing with My Skin. My skin has grown ears from long, painful years toiling and pain, of progress in vain. My skin has grown ears from long maintained fears of dying in vain, of crying in pain. My skin has grown ears from mother who hears. Young son has been slain, his killer no pain. My skin has grown ears from counting my years how soon till I'm slain by hate and disdain? My skin has grown ears. My skin has black ears. My skin is ears. And my skin has grown ears. Let me, just say, okay. Let me just say also how special this book is also too because it literally has everything you could really even ask for. Like it, it has just so much heart, so much soul, and you can even just tell also how, um, also, because I've also just watched my mother in general just put so much heart and soul into this book every single day as much as she can, so I'd love to give a shout out to her, of course, her creativity. <laughs> and just everything in general, because it's also, like, good to have inspirations about this book, too, that help us also, because there's just always just so much hate in this world, too, so it's, it's really nice to have just sources like this just inspiring us and showing and, and giving examples how we can how we can learn to bring each other up and just inspire each other more and more as we go on. So. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Timothy and Kate. We have a copy of that book on the table if you would like to check it out. In fact, any of the books over there are available to be borrowed if they have one of our green library barcodes on the back. The rest are uh, kindly brought today by Lynn to share with us, so we can't check those out. Uh, from our yes. from the Carrie Smiley Fortune Library. So. And I'll be bringing those to Griffey's later, later after this oh, to go for the point six. And now one more reader, Jack, I'd like to welcome you up to the podium. Hey, Jack! I don't know what you're saying. But I was only 84, it's a lot faster. Yay, Jack! I'm Jack Kearns. In the first uh, few years of my life, uh, of my married life, I lived here in Long Branch. Got to know the library, because I always liked libraries from the time I was a kid. Libraries were, were a resource. I remember I learned how to fix my first car. I had a 41 Plymouth that had uh, different ailments, braids, stuff like that. And I, I found a way to do it myself, but I had to go to the library to get a book to figure it out. So libraries have always been have a certain value to me. And I, I, I've seen this library grow in, in participation and attendance and specialization to deal with some of the things that we deal with every day. Even if we don't realize it or not, we have to live with it. 
Robert gave me this book. I wasn't, I wasn't prepared to come here to do anything but listen because I like to hear life stories, people talking about things that are in their lives so that you know, I can benefit from that, not just benefit, but enjoy it. One thing I found out uh, is that uh, love is a four-letter word. And it is a four-letter word. So is care. And there's a bunch of others that are publishable. We even put them in the newspaper. So I'm going to read this, although, as I said, I, I wasn't properly prepared before I got here. So if I stumble, bear with me. I know you'll be kind, because what I've heard, they talk about being kindness, being caring, being loving of others. It reminded me of my other days when I was a, a youngster. My graduates in high school, I graduated from high school in uh, 1954, last century. And uh, my, my salutatorian and valedictorian were a Jewish girl and a black girl. Evelyn Humphreys, and I don't know if there's any relationship, but Evelyn Humphreys was the, was the black girl. Okay. And, and, and I'll tell you, I, I never had any disrespect for any of them. They, they were always heroes to me, or heroines, I guess, but to me. They were the brightest kids you could imagine. And when, when things got stuck in the classroom discussion, they bailed us out, oftentimes. History especially, but other things as well. So let me try this. If I stumble, bear with me, okay? The, the title, this is from the Selected poems of Langston Hughes, Hughes, and uh, it's a poem called Crossing. Maybe that's what I'm doing, crossing into a world of, stick your head out, Jack, and stick your chin up a little bit and take a chance. As, as I listen to some of these things, I, hear, I remember my, my grandfather. I used to love to visit with him. He always had tales to tell you. Uh, and I remember the story that he told about, I grew up in, I was born in Jersey City, they lived in New Jersey City. And he talked about when he first came to this country, he couldn't get a job. And there were signs on, door, on doors, on the glass panes and, and windows and shops that said, job opening, Irish need not apply. Yeah. Irish need not apply? I'm Irish. Anyway, I was, I was in history at that point in time. And history is important to know what it was because it tells you what you have to change and what you have to go stronger with. So let me just try this. It was that lonely day, folks, when I walked all by myself. My friend was all around me, but it was as, I, as if they'd left. I went up a mountain in a high, cold winter, and the coal that I was wearing was mosquito netting thin. I went down in the valley, and I crossed an icy stream, and the water I was crossing was no water in a dream. And the shoes I was wearing, no protection for that stream. Then I stood out on a prairie. I stood out on a prairie. And as far as I could see, wasn't nobody on that prairie looked like me. It was that lonely day, folks, I walked all by myself. My friends was right there with me, but was, but was just as if they'd left. So even if in a crowd, I was alone. Is what kind of what this is saying. And I think each one of us is alone in some ways, but guess what? I'm looking at about a dozen people here, and they're with me. I'm in a room that's downstairs in the library. This wasn't even here when, the, when I first came to this library. I don't know what this was. It was a cellar, uh, kind of a dark, uh, not very tidy cellar. And it's changed. They, they've got a movie room here. It's great. They've done some marvelous things, and I get so excited. I'm a trustee here. But I'll tell you, it's like being part of it. I feel like what, what, what they are aspiring for are things that I can embrace, things that I can care about, the things that move ahead. And it's been just a few short years, when I think relative to my age, that this has been going on. And it's getting, it's getting faster and faster, and stronger and stronger. You now can find books on shelves before you didn't know what the shelves were, much less the books. Anyway. Uh, I, I, I decided to read this. Uh, thank you, Robert, for giving me the book, to get a, a chance to read it and look at it and see. But you know, there's more here than I was able to understand in my first or second reading through. What I found out is, and what I heard in some of the expressions of, that were readings today, there's more in those readings than just the words. You know? This is a great day today. This is a great day today. 
this is a great day today. Did I say the same thing? No. Some came from here, some came from here, some came from my back being tired of carrying things, or whatever. But how do you get that? You gotta read it again. I think I read it better than I read it. I read it to you better than I read it when I was sitting there in the chair trying to read it between the speakers. So it's important that we take time to think these things through, but don't take forever. History is what's happened. Today is what we can look at and see, this is today, this is where we are. What has to be changed? What can be changed today, tomorrow? We'll have to wait a while, but let's not stop. Somebody once said, if you fall down, it's not that it's so bad unless you don't get back up. And you get back up because there's an ambition, a goal, an aim that you want to do with your life, with you. I could lay there on the ground or I could get up. It may hurt to get up. Back last fall, I was crossing the street over in Seabright, and they had curbs there. there. Some of them, I think, are higher than me. But anyway, I started to walk up one, and I wasn't paying attention. I wasn't paying attention. And my left foot caught on the curb, and I went down on the hard tarmac. And my knee hurt like the dickens for quite a few weeks after that. But you know, I realized if I stopped there, I, I might still be on the ground. The cops would have found me if they picked me up. <laughs> yeah. But I might have still be on the ground. I carry a cane with me now. I don't need the cane all the time. When it's slick, slick streetways, I, I carry it with me just as a precaution. But sometimes I just carry, I walk on the boardwalk with a friend of mine uh, three days a week. I can't do any more than that anymore. And I carry that for two reasons. In case I need it, because it's a little slick on the boardwalk, but also to remind me of what was and how I've got to move ahead. And I may need that information, that history that's up here and down here to be able to, to, be able to progress. So thank all of you for reading. I think you did a marvelous job. You really, really did. And I appreciate it so much. And I'm glad I came today. I was able to get here uh, because you had a lot to share with me. There was more wisdom in the words you read and said than you'll hear any other day for the rest of the week, probably for that, or maybe more. Anyway, thank you so much. Thank you, Jim. Thank you, Jack, for those wise words. Um, thank you all for joining us here today. So we could pay attention to some black writers, old and new, familiar and unfamiliar. And uh, I really enjoyed sharing this event with you. I hope you did the same. Um, help yourself to the water bottle, um, look at the books, the poster display, and uh, I hope that I'll see you again next year as we do this again. And. Uh, so again, thank you very much. Have a wonderful rest of your weekend. And enjoy. Thank you. Wait, I didn't turn that one. Oh, you didn't see that one? Oh, you didn't see that one? I didn't see that. Oh, yeah. I saw both of them like two or three years ago on the internet. I just love them.